evening, everybody. A uh, very warm welcome to you all, uh, whether, wherever you are around South Africa and around the world, uh, from WITS University and WITS Sport and Health, WISH in particular. Uh, a very warm welcome uh, from our sponsors for these webinars, who's made the technical aspects available to us, and that's the Asina Lita Pharmaceutical Group, manufacturers of Zifo. We thank them for partnering with us again. Uh, thanks very much to Robin Saggers, Dr. Robin Saggers, who's in the background looking after the technical aspects and who's been promoting this webinar to all of you as well. And very importantly, a very warm welcome to our two guests, uh, friends of South Africa, both of them, uh, to Dr. Mark Hutchinson and Dr. Margot Mountjoy. Thank you very much for joining us from uh, Chicago uh, in the USA and uh, from Canada as well. We really appreciate you giving up your time and your expertise. And for today's topic, I really couldn't think of two more accomplished and experienced experts in the world to talk to us about leadership in sports medicine, ethical issues, particularly as they uh, pertain to young athletes uh, who many of us treat. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Dr. Hutchinson is going to take over and start his presentation, lead into Dr. Mountjoy's presentation, and then we look forward to you all posting your questions on the question and answer facility on Zoom, and we will filter those and get through as many as possible uh, to try and share as much of the knowledge that these two experts have uh, with us this evening. So Dr. Mark Hutchinson's biography is, is extremely impressive, and I'm only going to read those parts which are highly relevant to tonight, and that is that he's a distinguished professor of orthopedics and sports medicine, uh, and an adjunct professor of orthopedics and sports medicine in family medicine at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, he's dual certified in orthopedics and sports medicine and has 27 years of experience uh, at UIC, where he serves as the head and director of sports medicine services. Very importantly, in relation to tonight's topic, Dr. Mark Hutchinson has served Team USA at the Rio Olympics, uh, Lima and Toronto Pan American Games, Torino Paralympic Games, two World University Games, USA Gymnastics Team at the Atlanta Olympic Games. So really huge experience in dealing with young athletes at the very highest competitive level where the pressures are, are greatest. So we really look forward to that experience coming through uh, in this presentation. Dr. Margot Mountjoy is herself a very accomplished international athlete. She's a former international level artistic swimmer. She's a PhD clinical scientist who works in international sport for a number of the world's leading sports medicine organizations. For the International Olympic Committee, the Association for Summer Olympic International Federations, World Anti-Doping Agency, uh, the Aquatics Organization, FINA, for FIFA, and very importantly, for World Rugby. So anyone associated with rugby is welcome on our show, as uh, Margot. So welcome, and thank you very much for being here as an academic, as a clinician, as a researcher, as someone who has been a young athlete and who has worked with young athletes. We value your expertise and your input. So I'm going to hand over to Dr. Hutchinson to uh, introduce the topic of leadership in sports medicine. Uh, and we look forward to you sharing your knowledge with us. Over to you, Mark. Uh, thanks so much, John. Um, I'll get the slide here up and you can confirm that you're, you're, seeing, you're, you're seeing my, my slide. That's so, perfect. All looks good, thank you. Wonderful. So uh, yeah, I would like to begin by uh, uh, thanking uh, uh, John as this host, as well as uh, uh, Robin Saggers, uh, who's uh, his, the co-host of Help Putting This On, thanking uh, WITS Sports, uh, but particularly the WITS Sports Health Program, which is the WISH program, uh, and uh, your key sponsor, South Africa Sports Medicine Association, all uh, for uh, having me involved. It's an impressive group, and uh, uh, sharing this podium with an impressive group of leaders uh, talking about a little bit about leadership. I'm going to I'm going to walk you through some uh, leadership building and team building ideas, uh, and then uh, give you a few examples of when it goes wrong as a transition 
uh, to Dr. Mountjoy, who's going to talk a little bit more about how we're going to address uh, abuse in some of our athletes. Um, I have no uh, uh, specific disclosures. Uh, 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 the university does make some money or get some money from corporate sponsors uh, uh, through the years for resident research, but I don't get anything. If you really want my full disclosures, they're on aaos.org. A lot of the talk that I'm going to share with you is based off of uh, this article that was recently published in Current Sports Medicine and Reports, uh, Leadership for the Team Position, that I was able to co-author uh, with Fran O'Connor, Dean Taylor, Peter and Delicato, key leaders uh, in the United States, uh, based off of uh, a, a series of uh, lectures that we presented at the Advanced Team Position course in the United States. Um, we wanna start in terms of just thinking about teams and team building and some of the wisdom that we gained from teams and uh, in terms of what really are the operational basics of a good team. Certainly we have to focus on things uh, like the certain skills, problem solving, technical function within the team. Also uh, the commitment of the team. What are the targeted goals? What is the mission of the team? Do we have a meaningful purpose? And then ultimate accountability. Uh, both mutually with the, uh, the team members itself, but also the individuals or subgroups within the team. This, this is gonna become part, particularly important as we look for breakdowns in team building uh, because it's this facet that leads to potential areas of abuse. Uh, if we look uh, at really well-run teams and we're even outside of sports medicine, this is Netflix, Airbnb, Whole Foods, Patagonia, these, these companies that really shot into excellence. These what we call extreme teams uh, by uh, Robert Bruce. Uh, he changes, the, you look at these, they're different than conventional teams. A conventional team tends to look at things as the work to be done, where an extreme team looks as, a, as the work to a calling, a mission. Uh, it's, uh, it's a less is more philosophy where you can do less, but you gain great things. This is certainly something we see in the athletic population where our focus is on athletes, on success, and potentially on the pride that we have for our teams at a national or international level. So we are operating in a format and can be successful as an extreme team for most of our elite level uh, uh, sports that we're trying to deal with. The Duke, Health, the Duke Healthcare leadership model is very interesting because it surrounds what it takes to be a good leader uh, with certain facets, things, like critical thinking, like integrity. Clearly the integrity factor uh, is gonna be essential for all being on the same mission, selfless service. And if you look at this entire circle, everything's focused on patient-centeredness. So in a healthcare model, it's patient, change that word to athlete, and it all should be athlete-centered when, we, when we're working in sports medicine. In terms of emotional uh, uh, intelligence, it can be broken down to, uh, if is it about yourself or about others? Is it self-awareness, social awareness? In terms of the action, is it self-management and relationship management? This emotional intelligence is gonna then flavor how we're addressing this patient or athlete focused approach. So that's gonna be key to most of what we're gonna deal with team building and optimizing uh, a team within our sports medicine team. Now team building, uh, uh, we're gonna have examples uh, in the world of sports medicine and, and athletics. And John's already talked to you a little bit about some of my experiences at uh, various levels with national teams, uh, as well as with uh, my own team at the university, uh, as well as at the Olympic level. But I think we can learn these lessons from all kinds of things. So we have to pay attention. It can be from business. It can be from mission service activities. It can be from scouting. Uh, it can be from the military. Uh, and it can be for medicine. One of the things in medicine, I'll completely admit, I was a little resistant to when it got started and they said, okay, everybody, we have to do a timeout before we start my surgery. I'm going, why am I timing out? I know exactly what I'm gonna do. And they said, nope, nope, you time out for the team. So before every surgery, we stop. We say, what's the diagnosis? Which side we're working on? What are we gonna do? Well, the same thing applies or before some major event with team building. You want that team to build, that group that you already have in place to practice, to think about what you're about to do. And there's, you can actually have different fun and games think, types of things that you can do to start practicing that in advance. 
some key concepts to team building. So in terms of how do ideal teams operate? And they're really gonna be based off of these four key issues, commitment, collaboration, communication, and continuity. We're gonna walk through each of those uh, to have a good understanding of when you're working on your own team with whether you're a member of the team or where you're the leader of the team, the focus is of how to help make it better and be the most successful team that you have. First, commitment. The cornerstone of every successful team is the shared commitment to a shared goal or mission. The picture you see on your right uh, was the goal of the United States in the 1960s to put a man on the moon. Uh, uh, it was John F. Kennedy's uh, uh, statement and goal that we would do it before the a decade was out and they succeeded. But how did they do that? They did it because everybody on the team was focused on this complex mission of doing it successfully and getting to a, a live human being to the moon and back. The focus needs to be well-defined and it has to have universal buy-in. Everybody on the team needs to say, our goal is athlete health. Our goal is athlete success, team success. Whatever it is, it has to have that dedicated goal. Tony Dungy, who is a, uh, the head coach or the former head coach of one of the most successful football teams, American football teams uh, in the United States, wrote this book on the soul of a team. And he talked about selflessness, ownership, unity, and larger purpose. Everybody needs to take ownership of that, that mission goal, but they also need to be selfless. It's not about themselves. It's about the athlete first. It has to have that larger purpose beyond yourself to actually have greater success. For uh, 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 elite level teams and any sports medicine team, that means your patient-centered focus, which is what we've learned here, uh, which is gonna be teamwork, selfless service, integrity, all of this is still athlete first. The first person is the athlete. How is, how is what you're doing regarding the team focusing on the athlete? The second is gonna be on the team, the coaches, the overall success of the team. The last focus in the terms of the commitment should be what you're getting out of it. That, well, you get to say that you went to the Olympic games or did something uh, fun, but it really needs to be athlete first and particularly focused on their health first and then success. Collaboration being the second of the four key points uh, is really a focus on within the team, how do you maximize the contribution of each individual? It's very common that as uh, on a team, the leader, the, the boss, the head team position, Everybody starts looking to him and everybody goes, well, what's he think? We got to do what he says. And that's actually the wrong model. Uh, if you look at the picture, the team that I've kind of uh, created over here, actually, everybody used to say there's no I in team. Actually, that's not true. There are lots of I's in team. And what we need to do is we need to maximize those I's to that singular focus of success uh, of the mission. So you want to surround yourself by excellence. And some of that is singular focused people, people who want to have the same excellent. They're willing to join in the same mission. You wanna encourage critical thinking so that actually your thought is not the only thought. It's the fresh thoughts from the youngest person, the newest person in the group that sometimes makes the biggest change. So you have to be open-minded and be very open to creativity. Uh, the bottom line is, is that one of the biggest failures of team building is when you surround yourself by everybody who looks like you, thinks like you, or acts like you. That's probably the biggest mistake you can make. You actually wanna surround yourself by people who think differently, look differently, because it's their ideas that are gonna help advance you to the next level. And then ultimately, you do wanna find people that you trust. Trust both that, that you respect so that when they come up with a unique idea, that you can act on it. Uh, with that said, in terms of that collaboration, you want to then, as a team leader, figure out everybody's certain skill sets, because everybody's a little different. Some people may be the speaker uh, on a Zoom call, but some people are going to be quieter, and they just want to do the background work. But if they didn't do the background work, the whole team would fail. So you want to find their skill sets, find their gifts, find their passions, and use them for that total team mission. Uh, you want to ensure clarity of ro roles and responsibilities so that once you've identified skill sets, understand what each person is going to do uh, so that uh, it, you don't duplicate services. Or you find people that have mutual uh, uh, passions and gifts, and you have them work together to make each other better. Uh, uh, and then ultimately, you want to promote accountability within the team. So as you 
challenge them with a role of responsibility, you follow back up to make sure they got the job done. So uh, a group approach optimizes outcome and ensures a safe environment for many different reasons uh, because this group approach also provides oversight. Uh, so the collaboration so that everybody's not working individually, having shared oversight through each different facet of team activities is gonna be very helpful because the more people around those extra eyes is gonna help keep our athletes safe uh, uh, from, from abuse and some of the things that uh, Margo will talk to us about in just a second. Uh, a team approach also protects the professional. So this having uh, multiple people around rather than being the independent doctor who uh, uh, only sees a, a, an athlete by themselves in a hidden training room somewhere, that doesn't work out so well all the time for in terms of the health of the athlete. We want to have this team approach because actually I love to have an athletic trainer, a physical therapist uh, visit or come to my clinic with the athlete. They sometimes provide an insight that helps advance the care of that athlete beyond what my mind was thinking of at the time. So it helps tremendously. Now you also have to pay attention to that role of if you're the orthopedic surgeon, you're the head team physician, is sometimes you have to be very careful about that leadership role of how do you navigate that. Here you see some famous captains of different teams. Uh, the guy on the right is actually the guy who landed the, the airplane in the water, the captain of the, uh, uh, in New York City to save everybody's life. But the, the, the concept here is you have to think about the different uh, issues of being in the head team position. You wanna lead by example, share the mission, demonstrate the mission that the team has consistently reiterate that, that mission uh, 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 message uh, and what is a priority for the team. Of course, you have to be available, affable, and have a good ability. Those things are just kind of core to your success. Uh, but you also, when you're actually now working as the leader, you want to provide positive feedback in public, praise good works, share uh, good ideas, and good effort. And when you do that, you want to give everybody credit. You don't want to take everybody's credit. You want to give everybody credit because actually that's going to empower them to share more ideas and optimize the function of your team. So uh, if for some reason somebody falls, falls down and, and they're not as successful, they fall behind, they didn't do their job, that criticism should be done in private. It was something that my father taught me many years ago, praise in public, criticize in private. In fact, if you criticize constructively in private, that person oftentimes can be your biggest supporter in the future because you did it with appropriate respect. Um, now, when you look around, uh, you also, as developing that leadership role or the head team position, you wanna look around at different other role models who do it really well. Uh, here you have a couple of role, role models with John, John who's hosting this, uh, with Robin who's co-hosting this, and actually one of my personal role models who actually you can see is pictured on this slide that was created long before this talk, is Dr. Mountjoy. Uh, and what you find is you find the different leadership skills of each of these different people and pay attention. All of the people on my list, which is Jimmy Andrews, my mentor, Mary Lloyd Ireland, uh, Fran O'Connor, they're not all doctors. I have my athletic trainers, Bobby Barton. I have my athletic trainer, Mike Gilmartin. Martin. I actually have a chiropractor and a physical therapist because these people learning from them in terms of how they led help me become a better uh, a leader. So do that and, and, and uh, pay attention to all those different things. Now, the other facet here uh, in terms of the leadership pathway and leadership keys is of course, communication. You wanna promote sharing of thoughts, ideas, questions, and solutions. It's absolutely essential for the success of a team. Uh, again, like we mentioned before, you must be open to new ideas. And as the leader, you set the tone. You have to be open, you have to be positive, you have to be available. If you're not, people are gonna shut down. You're not gonna optimize uh, everybody's contribution to the team. Uh, and not sure if I already said that, I know I did. Give credit liberally and take credit rarely. Empower everybody else around you and the team will grow to much better, much higher heights than possible individually. I talked a little bit about the timeouts, uh, uh, routine timeouts, like while I was resistant for a time in the operating room, I've watched uh, uh, coaches at the highest level, this is our head coach of baseball at the university, they do an amazing job. It refocuses the mission of the team. Taking a timeout before an event 
to say, what's our emergency plan? Uh, uh, before uh, you have a, a big meeting like this, taking a time out to make sure that it's gonna flow smoothly all is all very important. Part of that is be very transparent, avoid secrets. Restricting communication is counterproductive to team building and undermines the success of team building. It leads to some members feeling left out. It decreases abilities of people to speak up their ideas. It creates a power dynamic of who is in the know and who's not in the know. And that has actually ultimately becomes dysfunctional for the forward thinking and the athlete care. Uh, you, want, uh, you may open a door to untoward behaviors if too many secrets and things are not transparent. So those things include abusive behaviors uh, that are, and generally, if you follow them, we'll show a couple of examples as we transition to Dr. Mountjoy. It's always surrounded by secrets and the absence of transparency. And so the worst uh, uh, failures of teams and team building uh, uh, is ultimately probably happens around secrets and transparency. So we have to avoid that. When there is conflict, uh, conflict management, the cornerstone of a team is respect for others. When conflict occurs, and by the way, it will occur, always does, some, some bump is gonna happen. Uh, you have to fall back on the cornerstone is respect for others and then address it quickly, address it confidently, address it constructively. Um, lay out everyone's perspective if there's a conflict within the team so that actually you may not be right because once you lay out every perspective, you sit there and go, hmm, I've, I've learned something too. Let's all move forward positively. You wanna practice shifting shoes, look from the other person's perspective. Uh, because uh, again, maybe, maybe as the head team physician, what you're seeing is different than the ath athletic trainer who is actually on the field working all the time of how to address a problem. Uh, ultimately, if you reframe a problem, a problem into a positive format, it generally works out well. I personally operate life as a glass half full and not ha half empty. Uh, if you're positive going in, it tends to be more successful. One of my partners every day starts his, his day off, hey, it's an excellent day. Great day, isn't it? I'm sitting there going, every day can't be a great day. But actually, if you start the day with a positive attitude, actually, everybody around you starts to get contagious of that positive attitude, and it works out well. So be willing to compromise to achieve a solution, and never forget the primary focus is on the athlete. It's not about you or winning the fight. Continuity uh, is the last facet that becomes important, is how do you retain quality staff? Well, bottom line is, is everybody wants to be part of the fun, be, be on a positive team, be on a successful team. So motivating that is good. You, can, uh, uh, you want to value everyone. So if you appreciate and value everybody on your team, it will help the continuity. Social events, team building events can also be helpful. Uh, and you wanna maintain this excellent. Buy courses like this uh, uh, and be willing to adjust. And then practice, practice, practice. Um, there's all kinds of different team building activities that you can do. Uh, I've, you can take your staff to some type of an escape room, which I've done, which is to kind of a fun way to solve problems and le learn what your staff's skills are uh, in terms of problem solving. It may be a game there, but later on, it's a problem dealing with a patient. Clearly, one of the best ways we can do that in sports medicine is practicing emergency responses in all types of venues, whether it's on the ice, uh, in the foam pit, in the water. By practicing those venues, then everybody on the team starts to understand when it's their turn to be the lead, uh, how to work as a team. It's a great way to practice it. So as I start transitioning to Margot, I want to then uh, uh, talk about the impact of poor leadership, when it goes wrong, and what's those, what are those problems? Uh, so the core still comes back to commitment, collaboration, communication, and continuity. But when it fails, if you have a loss of commitment to the right mission, then you risk abuse. If you, if you lose collaboration and it's an individual idea, then you avoid science and it's my idea and it may not be the best idea. If you have miscommunication or secrecy, then it also creates an avenue, an environment that's potentially unsafe for athletes. And if you have lost continuity, the team becomes dysfunctional.
So one way to assess this as we look at uh, potential dysfunctional teams is this book by Leanne Davey, who looked at this and, and suggested that we continually self-assess, continually reassess where you're at with the team. You don't wanna be a toxic team that's overly critical and overly negative. You don't wanna be the crisis junkie team that only responds when a major urgency happens. You wanna be functional all the time. You don't wanna have a bobblehead team, which means everybody on the team is saying, uh, yes, sir, Dr. Hutchinson, you're the smartest guy in the room. It must be your way. The team won't work that well. You don't wanna be a spectator team, the one that watches on the sidelines while an individual of the team uh, becomes successful. You wanna promote everyone's success. Um, we want to be, you don't wanna be a rumble tumble team that requires the passion and enthusiasm to make things go. We want to be functional at all times. So here's a couple of examples of uh, uh, when it really, really goes wrong and potentially avoidable catastrophes in sports. The classic one, uh, uh, unfortunately, is, is uh, Larry Nasser uh, with USA Gymnastics and Michigan State University. He ultimately, if we look back at things, operated way too independently. Uh, he had little oversight. Uh, he was able to uh, uh, work on athletes independently hidden, oftentimes in the pretext of medicine. There was little team collaboration. He had an athletic trainer with him sometimes, but not all the times. And uh, there was too much power or assumed power in a single individual. Uh, there was poor communication within the system. Athletes felt minimal outlets to communicate their concerns. Initially, nobody listened because they said, this guy must be smarter than everybody else. And quietly, there was an open secret. And that is, the things that were going on, the athletes said, well, does he do that to you? Uh, it must be right, because he does that to me. So the, 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 the open secret was not transparent, led to problems. When it goes wrong, it becomes a problem, particularly at organizational level. So this is Steve Penny, who is the uh, uh, leader of USA Gymnastics. And some several problems occurred uh, in terms of under the executive leaderships of the organization. The training site was held in an isolate, isolated location. They did not insist on a team approach. In fact, years before they had dismantled the health and wellness team at USA Gymnastics because of poor performance at an international event that they said, well, we need to just let the coaches do what the coaches need to do. Um, and then ultimately claims to came to light at the time when they did, they didn't have a response that was athlete focused. Uh, they were not open to communication. They tried to protect the organization first. So all of these circles around the patient centered uh, things failed. Ultimately one step above that at Michigan State University, which uh, is another place that Dr. Nasser practiced. The initial complaints were not believed by coaches, administration or police. They were not thoroughly investigated. It was not athlete focused. There was poor oversight and communication. It was, there was poor institutional integrity. Again, poor teamwork, poor integrity, poor self, uh, 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 it was not, it, it was more self-service and therefore the athletes suffered. Different example, Richard Strauss at Ohio State University, similar things, had 177 abuse claims over 20 years. Again, was too independent, had a poor leadership response from the, the, the organization and had failed communication. This was a, it's not just, it doesn't happen with doctors. This was a, a swimming coach, uh, Andy King, who was convicted of 20 counts of child molestation over a dozen female swimmers in the 80s and 90s. He was associated with USA Swimming, but what happened? Initially, there were complaints, but there was no organizational response. It was not athlete focused. There was poor oversight. A lot of similarities that occur with failure of the team that are potentially avoidable catastrophes. So. With that, it's gonna give me this transition now to Dr. Margio, Dr. Mountjoy to talk to us a little bit more about uh, 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 how to maybe help avoid and target abuse in our young athletes. I leave you with this message of commitment, collaboration, community, communication and continuity as the keys for an ideal team. And just as our transition, Dr. Mountjoy is gonna to talk to us about protecting athletes from harassment and abuse in sports, some things I've tried to lead into. Uh, Dr. Mountjoy, as John said, one of my heroes, amazing leader in the world, uh, has taken on some of the, the most challenging problems and shown us new paths. 
IOC uh, Medical and Scientific Expert Working Group on the Prevention and Harassment of Abuse in Sport, Regional Dean of DeGroot School of Medicine, Associate Clinical Professor, Chairman of the FINA Sports Medicine Committee. She, her list goes on and on and on. And so with that, I'm gonna uh, uh, transition this uh, uh, to Dr. Mountjoy and her talk. Uh, I'm going to start my talk to the kind of introduction. Uh, I have to mark that there is an I in the word team if you speak French, l'équipe. <laughs> and I'll now hand it over to you to play my presentation, which I did pre-record uh, because of the limited bandwidth where I live. Uh, so, um, Mark, please go ahead. Is it working? Thank you, Mark, for that interesting talk on uh, Perfect, leadership thank you. Support and the importance of strong leadership. I'm going to switch focus, uh, not from leadership in sport, uh, but from I'm going to shine the light of that on the specific topic of prevention of harassment and abuse in sport. So as in the introduction, my name is Margot Mountjoy from Canada. I'm an MD, PhD, clinician scientist, and a member of the IOC Medical and Scientific Committee expert working group on the prevention of harassment and abuse in sport. And I'm going to start my talk today with some faces. And these are faces that um, help for me anyway to frame the work that, that is in this field. It's important to recognize that the survivors of harassment and abuse in sport are real people. They're my athletes, they're your athletes, and they're people that are harmed by their experience. These are the brave women of the Larry Nasser uh, affair in the USA Gymnastics. Dr. Larry Nasser was the team physician for USA Gymnastics for many years, and these are photos of some of his victims who testified in court, giving their victim impact statement at his trial. Today, in the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about three specific uh, parts of this topic. In particular, I'm going to talk about the science base, how it applies in the Olympic Games, and what the role of the team physician, what your role is in um, preventing and also managing allegations of harassment and abuse in sport. So let's start with the science base. The first IOC consensus statement on the topic was 2007, and this particular topic focused on sexual harassment and abuse. This was followed up almost 10 years later in 2016 with an updated consensus which expanded the definition beyond sexual abuse to include other forms of harassment and abuse. And you'll see that in the terminology we may use is non-accidental violence in conjunction with harassment and abuse and support. And this has been translated since then in different infographics and various educational materials since this consensus statement uh, reviewed what was in the scientific literature at the time. So what is a definite safe sport? Athletes have the fundamental right to safe sport, which is defined as an athletic environment that's respectful, equitable, and free from all forms of non-accidental violence to athletes. Now this is embedded in the IOC Code of Ethics. It is also in many other statutory documents of the IOC Medical and Scientific Commission as well as the IOC in general in their ethical um, documents as well as their athletes' rights documents. There are four types of abuse. Uh, the first one I'll define for you is psychological abuse, which is a pattern of deliberate, prolonged, and repeated non-contact behaviors that exist within a power differential relationship. Now, this power differential relationship is clearly critical. It may be a coach athlete. It may be a sport administrator and an athlete or a junior coach. It may be a physician and an athlete. It may be a senior athlete with a junior athlete. 
but we do see from the literature that all abuse occurs within this power differential in the relationship. And very important about the psychological abuse, it's not a one-off situation where um, uh, something was said or something was interpreted. It has to be deliberate, it must be prolonged and repeated in nature. A very important caveat, psychological abuse is the core form of all other forms of abuse. And you can well imagine that the other forms of abuse would not exist without the psychological component. Physical, physical abuse is the second form I'll talk about today, and it's the non-accidental trauma or physical injury. Now, people can get injured in sport throughout the course of sport, especially in a contact sport within the um, course of training or play. That is not physical abuse. Physical abuse is the non-accidental trauma that's caused by physically punching, kicking, or biting someone. Uh, it can also look like, of course, a mandated inappropriate physical activity. That might be volume. It might be age inappropriate. It may be physique or skill level inappropriate. Or forced exercise when injured or in In some literature, there's also, um, it also mentions under physical abuse, physician abuse through medication misuse in us. The third type of abuse I'll define for you today is sexual abuse. And this is any conduct of a sexual nature and it can be either non-contact or contact or penetrative, where consent is either coerced and manipulated or is not or cannot be given. And I think that's very important to understand that the component of this is around consent and the coercion or manipulation. And by definition, a child under the age of 18, depending on your jurisdiction, by age cannot consent to sexual activity. And the fourth and final form of abuse I'll define for you today is neglect. And we take the definition from I'm going to walk you through the IOC conceptual model, and I'm going to take a few moments to explain this because I think it is very helpful for understanding. First of all, harassment and abuse occurs within an environment where there's discrimination. See on the top, there's discrimination, and in a continuum over time, these discriminations can become harassment and abuse. So it, it is in a cultural context, so that's the blue, the blue uh, column based on the differentials of discriminations, maybe by sex, gender, ethnicity, athletic ability, uh, religious faith, financial status, or any combination thereof. So those discriminations set up the cultural context of discrimination. Over time and with no uh, supports and protection in place, this, this will develop into harassment and abuse. And I mentioned the four types of harassment and abuse, psychological, physical, sexual, and neglect. Now, how these particular types of abuse are, are uh, um, implemented, maybe through different kinds of mechanisms. It can be through contact, of actual physically contacting uh, to, between two individuals, or it can be non-contact verbal. It can be through cyber mechanisms, and I'm sure everyone's heard of cyberbullying. It can be from actual neglect, or negligence, bullying, or hazing. Now over to the green bar on the far side, these are the impacts or the outcomes of harassment and abuse. And we've split these into athlete, athletic impacts and organizational impacts. And I'm gonna add one today for you. And that is impact towards teammates and family members. So the athlete impacts can be the physical, direct physical uh, trauma from the abuse, either cognitive, emotional, or behavioral, and certainly that's fairly common in, in the light of um, harassment and abuse. Mental health is a very significant impact of harassment and abuse. And there's also, for some athletes, uh, challenges in their relationship and economic losses from early dropout of support, um, leading to loss of um, uh, support either from the sport organization or from sponsorship. Now, Sexual and other forms of harassment and abuse also can have a negative impact on organizations. There can be damage to their reputation, loss of players and fans, loss of sponsorship, reduced public 
confidence, loss of trust, and general overall asset, dep asset depreciation. Now for families and teammates, and I have seen this in my clinical practice as well as in the literature, that in fact families suffer from this, knowing that their um, loved one has been through this experience, as well as teammates. And in fact, some teammates may even take it, take it um, and feel the impacts of the harassment more so than the actual victim. And I've seen that on, on occasion, and we don't quite know why. And it has something to do with perhaps resilience or makeup of that athlete or just their experience in general. But certainly, um, you bear that both families uh, and friends, uh, teammates, can also be affected by harassment abuse negatively. So let's dive into some of the scientific evidence. Basically, as this diagram shows, we know the tip of the iceberg. And there's more work to be done, in particular around the prevalence of the different types of harassment abuse in different sports at different levels and around the world. We also, uh, there's work to be done in identifying the risk factors of the um, particular social constructs around harassment abuse that we can identify and eliminate these um, precursors. And there has been limited evaluation of prevention interventions in the scientific literature. And certainly the long-term impacts are, for the most part, um, uh, entering the literature but remain unknown. So what do we do? What do we know? We do know that non-accidental violence or harassment abuse occurs in all sports and at all levels of sport. And that's really important, I think you should understand. And I'm going to repeat it. It occurs in all sports, so no sport is immune to this. And it occurs at all levels of sport. So no level of sport is elite. But we do know that the elite athletes are particularly at risk. And I think that's probably because they are, um, they have more at stake. They've been ingrained more in the culture and there's certainly more of a permissive culture. High risk populations other than elite athletes include children. And I think the child is more vulnerable with lack of voice and lack of power within the uh, sporting context. We know that the LGBTQ identified athletes are at also greater risk, as well as para athletes. Uh, the prevalence, here's some data from a, uh, a European study, Belgium and Germany, that shows psychological abuse in this cohort of athletes is 72%, sexual 31, and physical 25%. This is consistent with other studies. Uh, there's a Canadian study by Gretchen Kerr, 2019, showed very similar in a cohort of Canadian athletes. Uh, there's been um, other work done in the UK and Australia, which show very similar numbers. That's pretty high. Three quarters have, have witnessed or suffered psychological abuse. Perpetrators tend to be more often male than female in the scientific literature and more often reported as being members of, of either the coaching staff or the support entourage. And, and this is consistent with that power differential that I talked about. It can also be peers and teammates more recently, and as well, unfortunately, team physicians. Victims in the literature tend to be more often reported as female than male, but we know that male athletes also can be vulnerable to, to harassment and youth in sport. So how does it happen? And, and I think this is a really important diagram to talk through as well. It happens in the sport culture where the perpetrator has high motivation and inclination within a sport context that has low protection and high athlete vulnerability. So let me, let me repeat that one part. We've got a perpetrator with high motivation in an environment where there is low protection mechanisms in place, where you have vulnerable athletes. And I think that is, a, that is the perfect storm to create uh, a culture of a harassment and abuse. The impacts on athletes. Let's spend a little bit of time talking through the particular impacts. This diagram uh, really categorizes the different areas uh, quite nicely. It can affect, as I mentioned before, whether social, education, cognitive function, psychological well-being, physical, and performance. So we will talk about these um, a little further. And note that these can be, in some athletes, devastating and long-lasting 
and they can persist well beyond the end of the harassment and abuse. So even when the uh, harassment and abuse and or abuse stops, the impacts can continue on for a long period of time in some athletes. So the physical impacts can actually be direct uh, physical harm. And you can see from this uh, photo of the coach kicking the athlete. And that if you see athletes with injuries that don't, don't make sense, think about uh, direct physical harm. It can be from unsafe coaching practices, but it can be direct training, retraining, excessive stress, stretching, or using exercises of form of punishment. Environmental exposure, as I mentioned earlier, to heat, to cold, dehydration, hypoglycemia, malnutrition, and unsafe training environments. Unwanted physical impacts of sexual abuse, of course, can be unwanted pregnancy, STIs, and, and local trauma. Medical abuse, well, side effects from forced doping. I'm sure you're familiar here with the East German swimmers in, in the 1980s, as well as this uh, picture of Rochenkov, the Russian uh, guru in the, in, the, in the Sochi Olympic Games in 2014, who was involved with doping, uh, mass uh, doping uh, of the Russian athletes. There will also be side effects from medication abuse, and risks from unnecessary interventions, uh, that ph physician interventions on athletes. And interestingly enough, of the um, marathon studied in this particular study by Prune 2013 showed that, that over half of the athletes were using painkillers during a marathon. Some other uh, impacts, mental health, psychosomatic illnesses, disordered eating, eating disorders, anxiety, depression, substance use, self-harm, and suicide. Uh, these are um, certainly evident if you look at the Larry Nasser victim impact statements. Uh, they also research on the Canadian athletes of uh, Gretchen Kerr and the Swedish athletics athletes uh, in the study of uh, Timka discussed the suicidal ideation in athletes who had been abused in the past. We know that it can also affect cognitive, emotional, and behavioral function. The impact on sport, well, it can decrease sport performance. And in fact, there's evidence that an athlete who has been harassed or abused has an increased willingness to dope or to cheat. It can result in early athlete dropout and challenges in their post-career. It may affect their relationships, either socially, maritally, family, or in work and education. Mm -hmm. So there's something called the bystander effect, where there's these passive attitudes of non-intervention, where, where the people in power either deny or are silent when they know that harassment and abuse is occurring. And what this creates for the athlete is the impression that these behaviors are, they're okay. They're the norm, and we've got to just accept them. We've got to just suck it up and get on with it. And these, these passive attitudes of, um, of really what's called the bystander effect can be a compound psychological trauma for the athlete. On sport organization, if we lose our athletes, we'll have early dropout, we'll have reduced sport performances, loss of medals, increased risk of dopamine. As I mentioned earlier, damage to reputation, loss of sponsorship, fans, and asset depreciation. On the family, I think this quote says it all by one of the mothers of uh, Kylie Stevens, uh, and as well by Ann Swinehart. And there is evidence in the literature by Rackman 2010 that talks about the indirect abuse which occurs when children witness the abuse of others in the sporting environment. The effects on the entourage? Well, we don't know. We don't have any literature on this. I'd love to study this one. If you're looking for a good project, this would be a good one to look on the effects of a culture of harassment and abuse on other bystanders of, on, of the entourage. 
let's talk about harassment and abuse in the context of the Olympic Games. Well, it's embedded in the Olympic Charter, in the Code of Ethics that I mentioned, as well as the athletes' rights and responsibility. The first framework came into place during the Olympic Games in 2016 and for the youth in 2018 and will be in every edition thereafter, where there's a reporting mechanism for athletes to report in the safeguarding office as well as education programs. And some of these educational programs are in awareness animation that's available to you at this web link, as well as the safeguarding course, which targets athletes, coaches, and the entourage on how to recognize your best movies to power athletes skills to manage. So there's four lessons in this program, and I encourage you to find it on this web link and, and to utilize it with your support organization. There's a very interesting sexual harassment abuse e-learning tool where you click on the face of the athlete or coach in this picture and their story comes forward and they're learning the lessons about this harassment abuse. And for the youth, there's a draw the line um, video scenario of what is harassment and abuse, and there's a quiz at the end that the athletes can take, which is very youth-oriented. And finally, I'll close up with discussing the role of the team physician. What is your role in all of this? Well, to begin with, you have a role in prevention to making sure that your sport organizations have protection policy, codes of practice, education training programs, as well as appropriate complaint and support mechanisms and monitoring evaluation. And you should be following your medical code. What are your rules and responsibilities, boundaries and relationships and ethical behaviors? And there is the IOC medical code, which helps guide um, our, our, our behaviors as physicians with, within the sporting culture. We should be aware as clinicians of the athlete presentations of, of various um, results of harassment and abuse so that we can be aware when we see these things to think about this in our differential diagnosis. So if you have any of these um, uh, signs or symptoms, think about it. It doesn't mean everyone who underperforms has been harassed and abused, but if you see it in a constellation of other, other situations, it is okay to ask about it. And I often will say, you know, in other athletes who present like this, They've been having difficulty within their sport. And then just open it up like that and say, Has, could this be for you? Are you having any problems in sport? Is there anything bothering you within sport? And sometimes they may not respond right away, but they know that you asked and that you're a safe person to talk to. So by opening that door, uh, you will make it uh, more available for them to either speak up at the time or in the future. So if they do start to speak about harassment, it's very important to give them permission and acknowledge their bravery. Ensure their confidentiality within the limitations that you have within the legal jurisdiction. For example, child abuse is not something you can keep confidential. You're obligated to report it in many jurisdictions. Remember not to denigrate the perpetrator. This is someone who is probably important in their lives. It's important not to denigrate. Avoid leaving questions. Take the time, put your pen down, turn your chair and look at them and say, talk to me. Give them your full attention. Take the time it means. You'll get home late. It's okay. Keep your records. And it's important that you must stop the abuse. If they've come to you and you haven't done anything about it, then you become one of the bystanders who have not acted. So you must stop the abuse for them and report it to the mechanism of the place. And then take care of them. Look after their physical injuries. Look after the psychological health of the multidisciplinary team. And don't forget to support the teammates and family. So in your uh, sport context, I'm sure you know who to reach out to um, if there's an ACL injury or if there's a hyponatremia on the team. Who would you reach out to if you had an athlete with harassment abuse? Who is in your support team for this athlete? So please, if you don't have a support team and a multidisciplinary support team, today's the day to start finding one. So thank you. Thank you for your uh, interest in this topic and for protecting your athletes. Thank you, Dr. Sharma.
Wow, those were two absolutely superb talks. And uh, certainly from the messages I'm getting on our WhatsApp groups here uh, through the various uh, wish interest groups, huge, huge interest uh, in all the issues that were raised in both of those talks. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hutchinson, Dr. Mountjoy for really highlighting some key issues. And some of the messages coming through really highlighting that these are not just relevant to uh, sport, but to work environments and anywhere where leadership plays a role and where we as clinicians are supposed to be taking the lead in, in setting ethical examples and, and standards of ethical behavior. So some great uh, life lessons that we can learn there. And also some excellent questions coming through. So uh, if you're both online, I'd appreciate you uh, helping to answer some of these. So the first question, I think, Margot, if you can help with this one, refers to the sort of gray zone in the coach-athlete relationship where there's often a desire to build up some resilience in the athlete and there's some endurance of some hard times. And where does one draw the line in terms of pushing an athlete into uh, an area where uh, they are uh, feeling a little bit uncomfortable so that they can actually build up that resilience and not overstepping the mark to make sure that uh, you're not abusing the athlete? Where, where is that line drawn? Bearing in mind, you mentioned that different athletes can tolerate different levels of uh, a, a tough relationship with their coach? It's a great question. And I, I'd like to thank for asking the tough questions first off. So here we go. Uh, but it is, there is not a clear cut answer to that question because what is harassment and abuse for one individual will not be for another. And I think that's where the art of coaching is really key to know your athlete. It's okay to push your athletes into areas where they're uncomfortable. Uh, and, and that's, in fact, I think all of us can probably relate to the fact that we learn the most when we're in an uncomfortable state. Gee, I don't know the answer to that. I have got to learn the answer to that so that I can make a difference. And so being a little uncomfortable with what, where we are is actually a very fruitful learning environment. So for a coach to, to, to take an athlete into that area where they're pushed beyond where their comfort zone is, where they are challenged, it's okay to do as long as it's done in a respectful environment, in a situation where that's you know, mutual agreed, we're gonna, we're gonna push into the next level to get to the next stage where you, you, there's checks along the way with the coach and the athlete. And that's where that relationship is key, that it's a healthy relationship. There will always be a power differential, but if there's that healthy interaction between the two, it should, it should be a safe space to move some along. And I'm familiar, and we can learn from other areas. So I'm in medical education in part of my career when I'm not doing sport medicine. And we do this with medical students. We have to push them into an area where they aren't familiar, where there's some discomfort with unfamiliarity and not knowing what to do to have that psychological growth. So it is okay to do that, but you must do it in a setting where it's safe, where there's checks, where there's the mutual agreement and respect that it's being done for the right reasons and not the wrong reasons. So the right reasons mean for mutual growth and development of the career as opposed to um, gaining permission to harm someone. So there's a very subtle nuance that's actually a very important one to differentiate between an abusive situation versus a, a, gro a growth situation. I hope that, that makes it look somewhat excellent, more clear. Excellent answer. And in a similar vein, two questions related to what you consider to be prolonged psychological abuse. Because you can have a single episode where someone is unpleasant to an athlete uh, how, do you, how do you define the time frame of prolonged abuse? It's also a very good question because there's no sort of, like, you know, well, actually after 45 minutes, it's abuse and at 43 minutes, it's not. Again, there's no clear, clear cut answer for, for that particular individual. I mean, we've all been in situations where someone said something that sort of affected us and you kind of go, you know, well, what was that? Um, they must be having an off day and our relationship's good and we come back and maybe talk about it and move on and everything's fine. I don't consider that abuse. I consider that someone having an off day and maybe I misinterpreted it, but we've had a talk about it and we understand and we've moved on. It's not abuse. 
But if I have someone who's constantly, constantly pushing me, pushing me, pushing me in a, and uh, pushing me beyond, um, you know, in an uncomfortable psychological way, that's what I'm talking about. And for someone prolonged might be two or three times, but for others, it might be two or three months. So there's no defined time limit. It's, it's for the individual of, of what for them is too much. So again, it comes down to that nuance of the relationship of what for that particular person. So it's really important that as the physician or as the coach, that you understand who you're working with, who your team is. And that, that comes from the team building that Mark uh, talked about with the leadership and the team building is get to know the personalities, get to know who can be pushed a little bit more and who can be not pushed as much. And what to one person will be abuse and to another one won't be. In my country, there's certain cultural nuances that are unacceptable cultural things that are accepted in other cultures. And so when my culture sees that, they go, oh my gosh, that's abuse. It's like, no, that's a cultural norm in that country. So being aware of those differences between individuals and cultures is really important in how you define what is abuse and what is not abuse. Uh, sorry, Mark, go ahead, because I was going to refer to something you said, so I'd like your input on that. Oh, I, I just think it was, uh, it's very insightful. And the, the key here is one of the facets of team building is communication. And so even with, between the, the coach or you and the physician and the athlete, it's all about that communication, what the expect, expectation was, uh, uh, then yes, you can put, push them towards resilience. However, you have to be so open that when they go, that's a bit much, or I'm uncomfortable with that, then you can respond appropriately. The other, the other piece is uh, safe environments. And so as much as possible, you know, those isolated times where you're by yourself with an athlete, those are the at-risk times. If you can have two athletes there, so they'll speak up, or two coaches there, you're in a much safer environment for everybody involved. And I was going to add that that model that you sketched of a united team around the athlete that communicates well with each other and has set the ground rules early on would also help prevent that scenario rather than a dominant personality who's running the show. Uh, if there are more people that the athlete can approach and that feel comfortable talking to each other, even about difficult scenarios, it's more likely to, to prevent that sort of thing developing. Well, I think you're exactly right. And I, I think that your insightfulness of allowing us to talk together about team building and abuse and how, how these transition is actually part of the solution. And uh, when I have some athletes who you know, I'm a, I'm a male doctor and I have to address a female athlete with issues of the female athlete triad or relative energy deficit. Sometimes that's a difficult uh, discussion, but because my team is so well communicated, they know they can go talk to the athletic trainer or one of the female members of our team and we'll get it taken care of. And so part of that openness hopefully can address health issues, but also can uh, address early signs of abuse because they may mention it to the coach, they may mention it to another teammate, and then because we're open, it can address the problem early. Mark, you work in two very different environments. You're in a consulting room with four, four walls or an operating theater with four walls and you and the patient and maybe some colleagues where that patient's uh, medical issue is between you and them and it's kept very private. And then you work on the sports field behind you in the background where the interest of the athlete is the interest of not only you, but uh, the supporters out there, fellow teammates, the team owners, the sponsors, and the public who think they own the players. Mm -hmm. how, do you, what, how do you advise uh, medical personnel working with teams in terms of communicating medical information, in terms of the use of social media uh, when you're dealing with player medical issues? Yeah, those are, those are quite challenging uh, issues. And I think a lot of it comes down to knowing your role and your responsibility and what, where your focus. So when I'm on the sideline as a team physician, my focus is on the athlete. And so that's, I'm an athlete first focus. And yes, there are times you're, you're the, you know, the management says you're the team physician and asks you to go out in front of the press and give a talk. I actually won't do it unless I have consent of the athlete to say, yes, you can talk about that injury. Um, more often than not, and I know people are gonna handle these things differently on different teams, 
more often than not, I say, if somebody's pressing me to do that about a specific unique injury or health issue, I, I say, you know what, you need to go to the sports information director, i.e. the formal person for the organization who puts out the statement. Um, we just, we had some issues in the United States where the, the doctor for the, the president talking about COVID, he wasn't so comfortable in front of the press and he let things slips and got things confused. And so you need to be very, very comfortable in that environment in front of the press or social media. Uh, and when in doubt, be patient focused and side on the behalf of the patient and probably not talk about it. Let somebody else talk about it. Do you, uh, and perhaps teams in the United States standardly have either a consent form signed by players allowing you to share information with the other management uh, or perhaps have it built into their contracts? Is that something you would put in writing? Yes, another, another great issue. In fact, at our Division I university, they do sign consents uh, and uh, at professional, uh, professional organizations, they sign consents. Those consents are restricted and limited that is to say, uh, I am completely available to talk to administration and coaches about one of the UIC athletes because their intervention can help the athlete. So they're entitled to know. But in terms of release to outside uh, people, uh, press, things like that, then I'm restricted by every, uh, in the United States, we have both governmental responsibilities as well as at university uh, uh, laws called HIPAA and FERPA, which prevent us from releasing healthcare information without the direct consent. And the athlete always has the right to repeal that consent. So if one episode happens that said, you know what, Doc, I told you about abuse. You can tell them about my, my ACL injury, but I don't really want that part out. It's done. Not, not, they, they've not given you permission to disclose. You can't discuss it. Margo, two questions for you. Should we be, as clinicians, putting a question into our pre-participation evaluation about abuse? especially with young athletes or their parents? Have you ever felt uncomfortable in a situation, uh, any, anything like that? Do you think we should actually be more proactive and be screening for it as part of our, our workup of an athlete? Another great question. I would love to strive for that. I would encourage us not to at the moment. And there's a reason for that. Okay. Uh, so my, my response is I would love for us to strive to have that included in the PPE. However, at the moment, we do not have a validated tool or mechanism to do so. And we want to make sure that our questions in themselves do not trigger harm uh, and that are actually effective at finding out if there's a concern. So at the moment, I would encourage us not to, but when we're, what we can do at the preseason uh, meetings with the teams, we can bring it up from an educational perspective in terms of telling the athletes where they can go for help who's their safeguarding officer, what the safeguarding policies are, and that they can come to me, to you as the team physician at any time if they have questions or concerns. So there is a role in the pre-participation time to address this, but perhaps not yet in the screening tools because we don't have yet a validated safe tool. Yeah, Interestingly, very, very logical. Yes, Mark. Oh, I'm, I'm saying we have an interesting uh, challenge and I, I'd be interested to learn if you have faced the same thing in South Africa or in Canada, and that is we have reporting requirements. And so uh, at the university, uh, for if somebody comes to me and says that they were abused, uh, then I need to tell them, I tell you what, before you tell me, I have to report it. On the other hand, I can tell them if this is about abuse and you want to keep it amongst yourselves, there is a reporting agency that they can go discuss and you know uh, uh, deal with their emotions and deal with the event without a full release. And so uh, you have to pay attention to what those rules are. A lot like Margot has, has suggested, I think a lot of American institutions, certainly mine, uh, are uh, during our preseason welcome, they are all educated about here are your outlets for mental health, uh, for abuse, uh, for any issue so that they, they know what their path is should they arise. Yes, yeah, certainly in South Africa, and actually Robin raised this during your talk, that we are obliged in a pediatric scenario certainly to report those to the authorities. So, so those laws are in place. Um, Margot, 
Could you give us some guidelines, some tools perhaps in terms of techniques in reporting suspected abuse? So you're worried about a pattern that you've noticed as an insider within a team. What, what is the best manner in terms of trying to see that attention is given to this, even if perhaps you're not 100% certain, you just have a sense of unease so that we don't let it develop into a the US gymnastics type or Michigan State type scenario. Um, how, do we, how do we deal with that? Uh, thank you, John. And I think if your spidey sense, if I can use that word, if your gut is uncomfortable that something's going on, the chances are something is going on. So if you have that inclination or feeling, I, I encourage everyone to act on it. Don't sit back and wait, please act on it. And, and what you can do is actually speak first with the athletes involved and, and then just, you know, enlist them saying, you know, I'm concerned about what I'm seeing. Can you help me understand this better? What is your thoughts? What's your perception? And, and get them not, not to coerce them into an allegation or disclosure of an allegation, but to explore it with them. And, and quite often, if you open the door and give them permission, then you will learn more and then you'll have something more to go on. If you don't have that, you can actually go to the sport organization and say, I'm uncomfortable for these reasons. Can we get some help to come in, maybe some external help to come in and have a look at our processes just to make sure that everything is safe? Best case scenario is that everything's fine and you had a false alarm in your stomach that something was going wrong. But chances are, we as clinicians, if we have enough of a sense that something's going on that you're concerned, chances are you're right. Okay, I think that's, that's very sound advice. And the last question, again, none of these questions are easy, I'm afraid. Uh, you seem to be put on the spot every time, but that's the nature of the, the, the topic. What about parental or guardian abuse? You've noticed that the guardians or parents are pushing that child into a very uncomfortable space uh, in terms of their training and performance, and that you as a clinician are un uneasy with it. Uh, and it's coming from within the household. How does one deal with that? Again, I'll turn my camera off for bandwidth to answer that one. I think that's something that's universal. It's not unique to South Africa. I see it in Canada. I'm sure Mark sees it also in the USA. Uh, and, and some parents live vicariously through their child's uh, athletic success uh, and have other aspirations that maybe the child themselves will have. And, and I certainly think it's worth addressing. It's worth addressing with the parent directly. You may or may not be very successful in changing their approach and attitude, but that's something that you as a physician can discuss with your team. And by that, I mean with the coaching staff uh, and with the sport organization staff that everyone on your team should have the same approach to a safe, healthy athlete development for that youth athlete that has a management process for that kind of parent. We all have those kinds of parents. We're, not, we're all familiar with them, but what is the approach of the unified approach for the team? So as this physician, you're only one component. You can talk about the health risks of extra training. You can talk about the health risks of injuries. Uh, you can talk about the psychological development of that athlete, but then the coaches must be singing from the same song sheet the sport organization must also be on the same page. And if everyone is having the same message, those parents will be more easily managed than if it's just you and everyone else is buying into the parents' uh, uh, dream. So I think everybody attending this webinar can see why we asked the two of you to uh, be, be on this and discuss these very difficult issues because you answered every question with a plum. Uh, just from WITS University and WITS Sport and Health from the South African Sports Medicine Association. Thank you very much to Dr. Hutchinson and to Dr. Margot Mountjoy for sharing your time and expertise with us. Really two of the most insightful talks on topics that people are often very scared of broaching, but I think we walk away here with a number of tools that we can apply in these scenarios. So thank you very much for giving up your time and we hope in a, in a different world, we see you back in South Africa, the two of you, and we can talk face to face, perhaps over a glass of wine. And uh, we'd enjoy that very much, hosting you again. It would be certainly my pleasure. And I would long to see everyone again in person somewhere in the world. Uh, so 
keep safe everyone in the interim and we see you again soon in person. Super. Thank you, Dr. Mountjoy. Thank you, Dr. Hutchinson, very Thank much. Uh, we'll we'll keep in touch. Appreciate yeah. your time. Bye-bye. Right. Right. And thank you to everybody who attended this webinar. Robin will put up a slide which will be advertising the next webinar, which is on the use of hydrotherapy for healing. And he will also then put up a link which you can go to to uh, get the CPD points. But having registered for this and having attended, uh, as you log out, you will be sent those details and should receive your CPD certificate within the next 10 days or so. Again, a big thank you to the Asino and Lita Pharmaceutical Company for sponsoring, to our partners at South African Sports Medicine Association for supporting and promoting these webinars, and to all of you for your ongoing interest and support of WISH as stakeholders. Have a very good evening. Good night.